Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast, and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated. That's beautiful, man. It's a little bit psychedelic. Your banjo? Well, not literally, but... It is psychedelic. Thank you. Yeah, in the light, it really... It's awesome. That's a magic banjo, isn't it? Kind of, kind of. What's the deal with that thing? Well, this is my signature model. Oh, really? It's called the Golden Clipper. And uh, when I went to the Deering Factory, that's the company that makes this in uh, San Diego, to check it out and talk about what I wanted, they said, you know, I figured I'd just have regular pearl inlay. Uh huh. And then they said, or you could have this. And they hold up, held up a square of this stuff, which is called Dicro Lamb. Uh huh. And I went, well, I know it's kind of weird, but kind of cool. Okay, I'll do it. Nice. And, I love that instinct. And then I was like, I was losing sleep. You know, I'd wake up in the cold night terrors, like, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But then once I saw it, it's like, yeah. Are you a Libra? I'm a Capricorn. Oh, do you guys have problems with decisions? Um, not way. I wouldn't say out of control yeah. problems. Because <laughs> Libras, we're, we're famous for it. So that's something I would do. Like, decide to do something and then go, wait, should I have done that? Right. Well, I'm, I, I can't, you know, my eyes aren't the best, but like from here, it looks cool as hell. No, it is. If you get it in the sunlight or, you know, on stage with lights on you, it's, it, it pops pretty nicely. Yeah. So what does is, what is one of those go for, your signature series? Um, technically, you know, list 15K. It's just a banjo, I know, but that's what they go for because it's got, it, the, got the fancy wood on the back. Yeah, and um, it doesn't look that doesn't surprise me some, somehow being in the presence of it. Now, if if you're like a close personal friend of of you, like what's the what's the bro rate? On something <laughs> oh, I, well, I have to tack on a thousand for myself. Um, oh, so it like, goes up. <laughs> it goes, no, I'm, I'm, goes, I'm discounting it, and then it goes up from uh, there. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I, I honestly don't know. I'm not sure what uh, pr- nine ten wholesale I, I really don't know it's dope man yeah it's it's pretty how many of those do you have just the one i have one of these and then they made a lower priced model that doesn't have the fancy inlay. i mean it has that inlay but not the fancy colors and everything and not the abalone right. i mean they, they just spiffed it up they i didn't want abalone i didn't ask for that they put abalone up and down the neck and they made a gold plate i didn't ask for the gold plating i just showed up and it's like this kind of thing so it's like all right so there's a lower price model that lists at five or something like that. Can I just interject and say our guest, come to where I'm from podcast, is the great Tony Trishka. Tony Trishka. Th- thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks My for pleasure. Coming. And I'm, Joe, you should have, when I helped him carry those in, They're I heavy. the banjo was light. It is like three <laughs> times the weight of a guitar. It was insane. That's wild. Uh, totally. I know. I just got a Martin guitar and it's like, oh. Where does the weight come from? Yeah. The metal. It's all the metal. There's all this metal stuff in here. And it's got a resonator, the wooden wet resonator on the back. But it, it just adds up. This capo's made of metal. It's all sorts of stuff. Not to mention all the contraband he's hiding right. inside <laughs> the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. Dude, we can't talk That's about that. also where he puts his gun. It's every, everything's in there, dude. The thing's like fully loaded, bro. <laughs> he's got a, shot, a sawed-off <laughs> shotgun dude, in there. Dude, it's the end times, man. You I think know. You think that thing ain't loaded? You're crazy. There's a bandolier in there two. also. And he, uh, well, <laughs> duh. You never know when one it's all going to be. One has the semi-automatic and one has the... <laughs> the, one, the other one's the flamethrower. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to take any chances. Nah, man. You, yeah, know, know. you know you need to be able to scorch the earth whenever <laughs> possible. So how'd you get started with the banjo? Well, it was through the Kingston Trio, actually. It was a folk group from the late 50s into the well into current times almost. But uh, they had a song called The MTA, Charlie and the MTA. And their banjo player, Dave Gard, took a break on that that just blew me away. It went, may I? Oh, please. With, with your permission. Oh, sir, all day long. We're here <laughs> for it. It was something like this. And it was that sound right there that ruined my damn life. Yeah, people become obsessed with banjo, I feel like. It's an obsessive thing, isn't it? Like, I, I think of Steve Martin or like, a, like, what do you think it is about it that 
makes people have this like level of obsession? I don't know. I've I've been obsessed for since 1963. So yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure. You know, I, I've interviewed a whole bunch of people for various books and projects, whatever. And I'd say, what got you into it? What, what click that thing to on? And he's they would always say, mostly he's uh, the sound. It's just the sound, which is so obvious. But there's something about that that just kind of grabs. You know, if you have the gene that bad gene that makes you want to do that then that's what it is it resonates in the soul exactly in a certain soul a certain people's souls (laughs) yeah yeah for sure yeah it's kind of like this lonely yonder lonely yonder i don't know why i just said that (laughs) well no it's it's accurate because you know People always say, that, you know, the banjo's a happy instrument. And yeah. there's a lot of happy, fast stuff that you can play. But it it does get lonely, too. And, you know, it can have that lonesome sound. Yeah. But I feel pe- people, most people know about guitars. And, like, as a child, I've he- I heard of a banjo before I even knew what it was. When you have come from Alabama with a banjo on my knee. And most people will know the word banjo, but won't be 100% sure what it looks like or what it actually is. So... It's sort of enrooted in the culture, but not too many people I feel are fully familiar with it. Yeah, no, that's true. It's funny because just yesterday we were cleaning out our garage because what else are we going to do in the pandemic? And uh, I was with my son and, and I found the record, the cover of the album, the first album I ever bought, which was the Kingston Trio at Large that had that song on it, MTA. And on the cover, these three guys and two guitars and a banjo hanging behind them on the record cover. And it was like, it just brought it all back. That has that short string with that peg on the side and this white round head, and it just it's so iconic on some level. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of got excited all over just looking at that. Why does it have that short string with the thing on the side? What's up with that? Like, <laughs> just I never like, knew that I was have, a short string. I, I didn't even know that was there till right now. Um, <laughs> so, I did. I didn't mean to shock you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, my heart's palpitating. Um, it's it's an African. Uh, Invention, whatever you want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a drone string, so when you hit the low strings, or let's go from the first string on down. Oh, I see. So you it's get a the, high. it's a high. It's a high note on top, and there's. Oh, a so pin. it's not attached to the. Can you fret that string? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. When you go up the neck. So, but why did, what's the point of having it halfway up the neck like that? Or not, not quite halfway, but you know what I mean. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. It's interesting. There's a picture from the 18, uh, sorry, 1780s of a, an enslaved African wedding, or dance anyway, yeah. uh, that is in the uh, Rockefeller Museum in Colonial Williamsburg. And there's a picture of two people dancing and one gentleman playing a hand drum, another guy playing a gourd instrument. Uh, which is where the banjo comes from, this gourd mm-hmm. kind of a thing with a you know fretless neck. And there's a peg about halfway up the neck. Mm-hmm. And this is from like the 1780s. So it's definitely, you know, coming from Africa originally. And it's just a drone, you know, like a bagpipe drone almost. So yeah. That's a great. Yeah, it's it's a. Why cool, they never cool. implemented in a guitar? With the halfway up thing, I yeah, because also you you could make that still a drone string, still high, and have it just like be in the same party with the rest of the tuning pegs all the way, all <laughs> the way a down. Party going on down here. It doesn't You're have right. to get excluded from the party going on I, down. I, the, I know. Down the headstock. I I guess something about that lower position. Then then your only option with that string is to drone. Then you can't fret if you're down in the like near like because guitar players often are just down here right you know they usually don't even come all the way up here why would you i don't know do you need to no there's a guy named string bean who was a kind of kind of country comedian and uh he he said there's no money above the fifth fret right you know so yeah it's all down here there's nothing going on up here i mean That's yeah. all down there. You know. That's where your money makers are for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. That's, that's what the whole thing is about. So there are banjos, not to get too geeky, but there's something called a zither banjo, which was made by a gentleman in Brooklyn named Kemair who moved to England, and he developed a banjo where there's like a little canal that went through the under the fingerboard. Mm-hmm. So all the pegs are up here, including for that 
the string. See, he was asking the same questions I'm asking. I know, and he and did the, something he, about and then he it. Did he did something. The difference between me and him is he actually did something about it. <laughs> I'm not cutting on you or anything. No, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a value judgment. No, I'm just kidding. I know. So, um, but... So then, what what happened? Did you like ask your did your folks? Uh, did you ask them for a banjo, or how did you get? Well, how old were you and all that? I was about fourteen, and yeah, I, I pleaded with my parents. I was desperate to get a banjo. I'd already played guitar. I was playing some folk guitar, uh -huh. some Doc Watson, some things like that. But uh, when I heard that, everything changed. And uh, for Christmas, I got a Christie long neck banjo, which is what Pete Seeger he had a long neck banjo, and all the folk groups had long neck banjos. It was before I discovered bluegrass, really. Um, but at, before that, I was tuning my guitar like a banjo because I was so desperate to hear I mean, those sounds. You anyway. were desperate for it. I was it. desperate. And then Can you tune a guitar like a banjo? Yeah, pretty much. You know, the first string is tuned to D on a banjo, so you just tune a, a guitar from E down to D, and then you get the and the second, third, and fourth strings are all same as the guitar. So. So you changed one string, and I didn't have the short fifth string. I don't remember what I did for the fifth string, but you know, I sort of could fake it a little bit. Can you just capo that string alone, and it would be the same that'd effect? Be rough. That'd, that'd be, be rough. That'd be a rough. A special ca capo. A capo like for one string doesn't quite work. It would, you know, you get that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't work. You could try that. Anyway, but so that's uh, so yeah, I, I badgered them till I got one for Christmas. Were they musical, your folks? My. Uh, my parents were like lefties. I was a red diaper baby, and uh, I found out many years later that my father was a communist. You know, like Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger. Yeah. I guess Woody Guthrie wasn't technically a communist, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so we, we grew up listening to Pete Seeger and the Weavers and the Almanac Singers and all that sort of stuff. And my mother would sing folk songs, and uh, my father played some piano. He played some Fats Waller and Duke Ellington. So there was music in the house. My father was a physicist, but... Uh, they were like uh, musical people. They were musical people, yeah. And hippies almost, or uh, folkies. Yeah, folkies, yeah, more folkies, yeah. Yeah. That sort of thing. Pre-hippies. Pre-hippies. And my mother went to school at the Little Red Schoolhouse, not that far from here, with Toshi Seeger. Well, she wasn't Seeger back then, but Pete Seeger's wife, Toshi. Right. My wife and my mother, Toshi's named out. Yeah, Toshi, yeah. yeah. We had, do you know Toshi Regan? Yeah, we yeah, had sure. her on the podcast. Yeah, so she told us the whole, that she's named after Pete's wife. Oh, really? Yeah. And they knew each other and had a relation a, a really cool relationship with the Seegers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well they were amazing folks, you know. Toshi would kind of be Pete's caretaker, you know, and that's a whole other conversation about Pete and still one of my big heroes. Yeah. I wrote to him when I was fourteen and I said maybe thirteen, fourteen, I said, Pete, I think you're the greatest banjo player who ever lived. Something to that effect. And I uh, just wrote at Pete Seeger Beacon, New York. It got there, and maybe a week later, I get a postcard back from Pete Seeger. Dear Tony, I'm glad you like my music, but music's not like a horse race. There's no such thing as best. And so he signed it with a little banjo, and you know, because he would answer every th piece of mail that came That's to him. That's crazy. That's wild. Pete <laughs> Seeger Beacon, New York. Let's hope it gets there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as I like to say, I mean, it's sort of like Santa Claus, North Pole. It's yeah. going to get somewhere. That's so, funny. Yeah. That'll change your life, getting something back like that. Oh yeah, yeah. It was it was pretty. Those amazing. little moments where you're where you're acknowledged and given like the support. Yeah, yeah go for it, kid. Yeah, yeah. No, Pete was the greatest. So did you dive really heavy into it, like just getting amazing at it quickly, or what was the story there? I was did you again, get a I teacher. Was, or? Uh, yeah, I had a teacher a guy named Hal Glatzer who lives in Hawaii these days, and he was. I went. I grew up in Syracuse. My dad taught at Syracuse University, and. Um, I went to a hootenanny, and there's this guy playing bluegrass banjo, which is what I wanted. And I cornered him, and he started giving me lessons in the, the laundry room at Del Plain Dormitory at Syracuse University. And right off the bat, he was showing me, you know... Right, like first lesson. Your turn. <laughs> Fuck that, bro. He wins. If this is like that crossroads, I'm just going. I go ahead and like go ahead and surrender right now. <laughs> yeah. No, he just showed me that, and I was like, "That's it. There are all those notes." It yeah, was, but he shows you it, and you just do it, or like, nah, what's the learning to, like, curve? On you have that to like thing? like finger picking takes so long because I Years? do finger pick too, and it takes a long time to you know. 
Well, I was, I was finger picking on the guitar, so I had the you know I had that coordination going between left and right hands, and I'd listened so much. In fact, there, this guy Eric Weisberg, who was he's the guy that played dueling banjos. It wasn't that kid in the movie, and it was his arrangement of it that I had listened to cr like crazy. So I, I I knew the sound, and once he showed me that, and and. It was all, oh, yeah, I know those sounds, and it just kind of fell in place pretty quickly. So, uh, really, but you must have obsessively finger-picked for a long time, but like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, again, on the fake banjo, the guitar banjo. On the fake, so by the time you got the real banjo, you were already kind of... Sort of doing it. Sort of doing it. A little bit. I, didn't, I couldn't quite find those sounds, but I, you know, I sort of... I had the Pete Seeger book. The Pete Seeger, he put out a book in like the late 40s, the first banjo instruction book of the modern era and I was trying to learn stuff out of there and was kind of having a hard time so but I you know some cool pictures of banjos and people playing banjos and uh, anyway did you work with a metronome when when doing all that or a rhythm machine or anything like that no but I took piano lessons and flute lessons before that when I was really young and you know there was a metronome clicking away my first experience of the metronome was uh, I did a, when I moved to New York in 73, uh, I did a session for Ford Motor Company or something and with strings and the whole thing and I was doing a banjo overdub and I had a, there was a click track in my headphones and I'm playing along with it. Man, that metronome is like off, it's speeding up and slowing down. And no, it was me. I just yeah. had never played banjo with a metronome before and finally kind of figured, oh, okay, I better get this together. Yeah, because that's a skill to learn. Yeah. I, I started playing with a metronome early on. Did you? Yeah. Is it, well, that's like I'm a good click at, track, I'm good right? At it. Yeah, it's a click track or a drum machine would be the same thing. Yeah. Or a drummer if they're good. <laughs> 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 but I mean, because like with all that finger picking and stuff, there's a, that's so intricate on a rhythmic level. It's like the rhythm of it is wild, really. It's pretty intense. You know, Earl Scruggs, without whom I, would, I wouldn't exist without Earl Scruggs. And um, I got friendly with him in his later years, and I interviewed him, and we would hang out, whatever. Um, and he said that what he brought to the banjo was syncopation. Mm -hmm. He brought a lot of other stuff besides that, but he was saying that. He has this one lick, which, to your point, just talking about rhythmic stuff, um, see. Let's look here. In fact, that thing I played earlier by the Dave Gard of the Kingston Trio, he went, which is kind of right on the downbeat. And this is. Just highly yeah. sophisticated kind of rhythmic stuff, and the, there yeah. are other examples. Besides it's like almost that. like paradiddles or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like you know some hip drummer doing something, and he just was a genius. I don't think he sat down. Okay, I'll, you know, he wasn't figuring out where the beat would go. He just did it, and it was amazing. Right, because it's always like what you, like the syncopation or whatever. It's always like it's always, I guess, a, a, a staccato instrument in a way. Yeah, like it's it's sort of. Uh, lives in that staccato place <laughs> it totally it doesn't it doesn't get to like be distorted and go no, you like for your guitar and you could like hit a fuzz pedal it's like Ooh, <laughs> you just sit there and fucking lean on a note for 25 bars you know yeah that's why like in, somewhere in the late 60s early 70s a lot of banjo players went to pedal steel guitar oh okay including myself it was like oh, i want some sustain i want some sustain can i have a little sustain please yeah yeah is there a way to have you ever uh, like thought about formatting a banjo to where you could like play a banjo with a slide and and somebody must have like plugged in a fuzz box one of these days oh yeah and yeah, and, f and and done like slide banjo or something like <laughs> tried to make it more of a sustained instrument oh yeah well i I've done some slide I, I did a song called Hawaii slide O pardon the really bad pun. Uh, but it was with slide. I, I got into slide a while back, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Just went through the slide period. So, where uh, so so the banjo could then become oh, yeah. a sustaining instrument. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I have actually a national banjo. Uh huh. It's like a one-off apparently, and uh, and I played it on that. It's tuned down to E, so the strings are a little thicker and it works a little bit better. 
But I've also messed with an Ebo on the banjo. Right. Which is somewhat limited, but you can get total sustain on it. Yeah. And I've plugged in, I've done Wah Wah, and, you know, just I had an electric band for a while. So, I've, yeah, I've tried all that stuff. Yeah, so you went out there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So uh, Ebo, for people that don't know, is a, a magnetic uh, electric bow. It stands for electric bow, so it, it sort of simulates what a violin bow does, but it, it's on magnets, and it's a battery-operated thing, and it, you know, like the... Is that that light? Yeah, like on? the guitar part in David Bowie's Heroes, like, ooh, I don't even know. That could just be distortion and <laughs> feedback, too, but just a long, sustainy electric yeah. bow type thing. Yeah, and it just goes for a long time. So it mostly just works on one string, but it, you know, I messed with it some. Is there still place for innovation in the banjo these days, or it's pretty nope, much... Nope, it's all done. No, <laughs> I mean, what was... Put it, put it in its case. What was the latest... <laughs> There's what, no more, no room to grow. What was the last jump for you <laughs> that you felt, okay, wow, this is something new that, you know, I don't, I didn't know how to do? Well, I mean, there have been various jumps, but Bela Fleck, who Bela used, Fleck. Yeah, and, you know, he sort of broke the gentleman's agreement on how good you could get and just got... Was he amazing. a pupil of yours? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I gave him lessons when he was 16. He had had two other teachers before, before me. But then um, I put out this really weird album in 1973, which was my first album, and there was all sorts of crazy stuff. What's on that it. called? It's called Bluegrass Light. Okay. Um, and it's been released, uh, re-released as the early years. Tony Schertzke, the early years. You know, you're getting old when you have the early years. Anyway. Was it light, as in light, or light? Light, like. Light. Not like light jazz or something yeah, like that. No, that's yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, but is I, it light bluegrass or light? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> light. It was light. Bluegrass light. Thank it's you. It's in light. Yes. Uh, but anyway, he heard that, and uh, he had a teacher named Mark Horowitz who, was, uh, who lives in Staten Island who was having to learn these songs from my album that he wanted to learn. And I was living in the Bronx at that point. And after a while, Mark said, it's too hard to learn these crazy tunes, so why don't you just go to Tony's who lives in the Bronx? So anyway... And and he was living on 75th Street with his, with his family. So anyway, so he was 16, and within a you know a couple of months, it was like pretty obvious that this guy had all the goods, and he just continued to grow from there. But I showed him all the weird stuff. I, I would, I would jam out on some straight ahead bluegrass tune and get kind of weird with it for you know three or four minutes, and he'd record it and then come back the next week having learned every note, uh, perfectly, and play it back at me. So, you know, Bela was a big jump forward. Is it because he b- brought the banjo into the jazz world? Like, did, was he the first person to do that? Uh, I wouldn't say the first person, but um, I mean, Louis Armstrong had a guy named Johnny Sancier playing with him and were on the with the Hot Fives and Sevens and whatnot, playing a six string banjo. But and Duke Ellington had a banjo before he gave it up for the guitar. Um, there's a guy named Pat Cloud who was out in California who was doing some bebop stuff on the banjo pretty heavily but didn't get out there like Bela did. Not to, to obviously take anything away from Bela, because he, he really did it in his own way. Um, and, and I was working up Charlie Parker solos around, you know, before Bela was doing that. I mean, not to say I did this first, no, you no, know, that no. kind of thing. By but the way, it, you it, totally gave Bela a huge prop, so you don't even have to worry about that. Like, yeah, yeah I mean, no, it's fair enough. It's just a, Yeah, I mean, we all a, jump off, and a guy named Bill Keith was doing jazz. He did Jordude. Dude. And, yeah, and, so, okay, there was a precedent It, it, it was that. out there, but that not like sense. he did it. You know, right. he, he opened up the fingerboard because a lot of people were, you know, were working out of a chord position. A guy named Don Reno was doing some jazzy stuff in the 40s. Uh-huh. But that's kind of out of one position, out of these chord positions. But Baylor thought, why be boxed in and just you can just move all up and down the neck and made it more of a scalar, linear kind of an instrument, huh. uh, which is one of many, many innovations he came up with. And then more recently, a guy named Noam Pekelny, N-O-A-M, Pekelny, who plays with the Punch Brothers, with Chris oh, Thiele. Yeah. Chris Thiele, he's, he's, he sort of took the banjo to a whole different place uh, than Bela did, I mean, jumping off of some, to some extent off of what Bela did, but kind of came up with his own vocabulary is also opening up new territory in a different way. Not like Bela sort of broke new ground and moved everything forward. Gnome is a little more kind of parallel with with what Bela did. Not sounding like him, he's got his own sound, but he's coming out of bluegrass, but can do all sorts of different things. 
but he's opened up whole other things as well. I shouldn't say that exactly, but he's he's the one after Bela, and now we're now there are all these other younger people that are coming along that are doing amazing, you know, heavy duty bebop things, and you know, there's like twenty. You gotta hate people like yeah. that. Yeah, well, they're all on YouTube. <laughs> too. Learning they're on like, the yeah, like exactly. The the old old videos. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what's it? So Bela like basically took the fretboard up. Nobody was really doing that before, huh? Not like he did it. No, again, this guy Pat Cloud was doing it, but he was just sort of isolated out in California and wasn't touring, wasn't recording. And I, I'd met him in the '70s, and it was like pretty astounding what he could do. He's got maybe one album out. What's an example of playing like that, going up the fretboard or something? Do you have anything? Like I that? don't really do you what Bela does like that. Do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I move up the fret fretboard. And I mean, I do it, but in a different way. I don't do it, like, linearly. I mean, you can do stuff like a... So l linear means more scale-wise instead, instead of structured around chord. Exactly. Chord shapes, and you're still structured around chord shapes. Right. I mean, you can do... Um I mean, you can move around scale or... I do some of that, but not like Bela does it. He's just taking it to a whole other level. So. I feel you. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, no, it's really cool. So wait, did you, you did something, you played with William Burroughs or something, or <laughs> you accompany William Burroughs, or what? Uh, okay. Who's William Burroughs? Uh, he wrote Junkie and Naked Lunch, and uh, he was like he's a beat writer. Beat, early beat writer. Early beat writer. Like He was like with uh, Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac, and they were running around New York City revolutionizing stuff. Yeah, I, I, it was kind of. I've just had these crazy run-ins with some amazing people. That, how did that happen? Anyway, I was working with this guy Eugene Chadbourne, who's this crazy guy from North Carolina, guitar player, and he wanted to do a tour with me. And I said, "Okay, sure." And this was in the earliest '90s, and we ended up in Lawrence, Kansas, on this tour. And it was mostly his places, and you know his scene, but um, we ended up in Lawrence, Kansas, and before the, as we're driving into town, he said, you know, William S. Burroughs lives here in Lawrence, and it'd be great to meet him. Mm -hmm. So before the show, he's talking to the bartender, and the bartender says, well, Bill Burroughs, is, he's always at this uh, drugstore where they buy, he buys a newspaper there, you know, every morning at 11 o'clock. If you go there tomorrow morning, you'll probably run into him. And then in between sets, uh, this guy Eugene's talking to some guy, who turns out it's uh, it's Burroughs' secretary and lover, I guess. I'm spacing his name right now. And we got invited to go to Burroughs' house the next day. So the next morning we show up, and um, I can't remember what it's called, one of the monsters from Naked Lunch, when they made the movie out of it, uh -huh. the Ornette Coleman soundtrack, there's one of these monsters sitting in a barber chair as you look through the window. Just a simple house, you know, we walk in, and there's Burroughs. Uh, yeah, I've, I've actually, I actually walked by the, his house there. Oh, okay. So, so I've seen it. It's a small little crib, just a nice yeah, little crib, whatever. nice little crib, yeah. And we yeah. go in there, and we, we'd each bought a book for him to autograph. I bought a book called The Western Lands, which is a, the Egyptian thing for heaven, you know. It's a, an amazing book. Um, and we just hung out with him in his living room for a while, and uh, and Eugene was pretty nervous. I would because his burrows, you know. I didn't have a, th you know, it was kind of cool to meet him, but I wasn't like nervous. And he had these paintings on the wall, and I said, "Oh, is that a? Uh, are, are those yours?" Because I knew he'd done shotgun art and that sort yeah. of thing. And I, he said, "Yeah, yeah." These and they were finger paintings. Uh -huh. and he said, "Come here," and, and we go into this back room, and he's got these piles of paintings, finger paintings, one of which has a, a cross on it, and then finger paintings around it. And then the next one had a scrotum, pardon my French, with, you know, finger paint around it. And he was saying, hey, look, at it. you can see a duck in there, and there's a camel. You know, it's like you look at the clouds in the sky. This is a sort of random finger painting. And he was like, there's Burroughs doing that, you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he said, I want to see my goldfish pond. And we said, sure. We go out and back. And he had these, he was missing a goldfish he just had to put in. And. And then afterwards, we got he autographed our banjo heads because Eugene played banjo too. So it had you know William S. Burroughs instead of Pete Seeger or Earl Scruggs. It was you know William yeah. S. Burroughs. And he talk signed. about a psychedelic banjo. <laughs> 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 yeah, and I was on stage at this festival. With, you know Peter Peter Rowan. Do you know who he is? Uh, Peter Rowan. He was with Olden in the Way. He was in that band with Jerry Garcia. And oh, okay. Anyway, he, he's I was playing in his band for this festival, and he looks over and. Is that Scruggs? What? It's, no, it's William S. Burroughs. What? what? So anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so that, and anyway, so I did an album called 
um, world turning, and I wanted to have a spoken word thing in there from this old banjo book, and uh, he agreed to do it. And so, how'd you contact him? You got his number back then, or well, when I was there, secretary, yeah, from it. his secretary, <laughs> we, he made it happen, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, he did it for five hundred bucks, pretty cheap for William S. Burroughs, and uh, and so I was in touch with the secretary, and you know, he said he would listen to, he would read through this thing and see if he wanted to do it. So I got in touch with the secretary. So does he want to do it? Oh, he already did it, and so they sent it to me, and we. I added the banjo part underneath it, so I wasn't there. <laughs> and it's done, so, yeah. He probably just recorded it on a cassette or something, right? Or? Uh, no, it was a, I don't remember exactly what it was. It wasn't a cassette, but it was, you know, it was somewhat low-tech, but it worked. You know, it sounded good. What, uh, so what an amazing voice he has got. Jeez. Oh, he really does. Just the ultimate, like, yeah. Yeah, hipster, hipster aging. I want to say junky voice, but it's, that's, <laughs> that's too reductive. I don't mean it that way, but, like, yeah. you know, there's something... Um, there's something knowing and seedy about it, and like be yeah. beautiful though too. Like, oh yeah, it's yeah. It it has a, it has the street in it. it. Definitely has the street in it. No, it's, what, it's do you can you play that that song that you, he wrote on or uh, something? It was again this world turning album was a history of the banjo album. So uh, I had some minstrel style banjo, which was based on you know African music originally, but you know, it was a white appropriation of white of of that. But you can hear African roots. Uh, it was on a, a gourd banjo that I played it, and uh, different tuning, and the, yeah, I can't really do it justice on this thing. So it has, so the banjo has the African roots. Can you play something that along those lines that's kind of got an African sensibility? I always thought it was like an American, like southern instrument that's because you saw deliverance too many times <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh boy you know i mean the banjo as we know what with the drum head is is an is an american invention yeah. kind of dating back to the 1840s and stop me if i get too geeky with the uh, history thing but in the earliest banjo instruction books or instructors from like the 18 mid 1800s um there's a tune called juba which is this kind of hand slapping kind of a thing and uh, the earliest, uh, one of the, I think the first African American to be in a minstrel show was named Juba, and it's kind of a frenetic dance that the enslaved Africans would do in the West Indies. But anyway, it's this tune that goes something like this. Again, this should be on a whole other instrument, but it sounds something like. Taste of it, just a very simple melody with rhythmic variations on it. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful sound, and I'm I'm doing what today you call claw hammer style instead of the picking, but it comes from back then. You know, it's more of an African rhythmic thing where you're strumming down and then picking up with the thumb like that. So it's a whole other style, uh, but that's so what you're doing strumming and then picking with the thumb. Like yeah, you kind of strum down. I'm strumming down with the index finger. Yeah. And then the thumb's resting on the fist string, and as you uh, lift it away, it activates the fist string. It's kind of uh, like it's kind of like slap bass, yeah, <laughs> like that. Yeah. All comes from the banjo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. Hey, you were a bass player. I forgot <laughs> yeah. for a second. Yeah. So you're not really familiar with that style, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding, that sounds so I, amazing. That sounds I great. I listened to some Red Hot Chili Peppers back in the day. <laughs> no, I like I like Brothers, Brothers Johnson, Louis sure. Johnson, all that. Oh yeah, yeah, man. So, um, wow, that's really nice. I yeah, because uh, yeah, you're strumming down with the fingers and then you're picking with that thumb, but it's the high string that tricks you. It, yeah, that's the beauty. It goes to lower strings too, but you know what. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever thought about like, did you ever write songs like where you sang and wrote lyrics and stuff, or melodies with singing, or do you just stick to banjo mostly? Uh, I'd say every album I ever put out, I've had, I would have one song where I wrote lyrics, and I have this other album that's taking about twelve years to come out, 
called uh, This Favored Land, which is hopefully going to be forthcoming. Get... That's what it said in your bio. Yeah, I know. It's been forthcoming for a long time. <laughs> it's, it's been on that on bio for a while. It's time, time to get rid of that forthcoming. <laughs> and cross the forthcoming. Cross and the line. Release. 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 Release it, bro. Release it. Well, I was, I was going to be doing a tour starting uh, next week. And it was going to be out now, but then something got in the way. I'm not even sure what. So right. maybe September it'll come out. It's it, it basically, I'm, I made up the story about the Civil War. I mean, it's historically based mm-hmm. in various places. but And I wrote lyrics. For, it's like 12 songs, and I wrote lyrics for all except for one. That's amazing. Are you yeah. singing? No, I wouldn't dare. Why? I you would. have a great voice. <clears throat> Thank you, but I have an adequate voice. I mean, not I'm, to disagree I'm, I'm, with you. I'm listening to your voice. It's very nice. It's got a great quality to it. And I don't know if you know this, but singing is just sustained talking, Tony. <laughs> I, it's just the uh, talking and then, ah, now we're singing. <laughs> it's not. Wait, this is an epiphany. Is that, uh, is that uh, blow, am I blowing your you're mind? You're blowing my mind. I'm just, I mean, fi- first finding out that there's a peg on the side of the banjo. <laughs> and, and now this, I'm just falling over. I'm just. Uh, good thing woo. you came today, man. I know. I'm <laughs> apoplectic. I don't know what to say. This man. is really something. And it's time for that album because uh, we're we're in a time where the civil war might happen again. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I it's know. like it's kind of perfect timing for it. Yeah, I know. And and what bad time to have a title this favored land. <clears throat> yeah, which is taken from Lincoln's first inaugural no, address. No, it's good. I think it's good. I, li- I saw that. And went. This is the title. It's perfect. Yeah, I got Van Dyke Parks to write a horn arrangement for. I, I wrote this march based on listening to a bunch of civil war marches. Wow. Are you familiar with Van Dyke Parks? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I imagined you would be. One of my another one of my culture heroes. Yeah, from Song Cycle, which came out in '67 or something, which is one of the most psychedelic albums that ever came out. Uh huh. Yeah. Nice. Anyway, this favored land. Yeah. And what what what's the poetry behind that? Um, or why why what what made you want to pick that as the title? Well, the title is again from this Lincoln inaugural address, right. but. Um, <sighs> It started, I, I wrote this song about a riverboat gambler using a Jimmy Rogers uh, blue yodel kind of a sound. And I wrote all these lyrics for that. A riverboat gambler. Yeah, you know, in the 1800s. I, I just had this urge to write lyrics. I don't know why. And I just did that. And then I started thinking, oh, I could, then I got an urge to write about a train, the great train robbery in 1863 where these Union spies came in and uh, hijacked a train, a Confederate train. While it was stopped, people were stopped for breakfast, and they went and they were going to tear up railroad lines and cut telegraph wires. And I wrote a song about that. I like that. And then it started building from there. Right. And uh, and um, then I had a ch- I was in North Carolina in Asheville visiting some friends. I was gigging there and visited some friends. Did you go to the Moog factory and tell them that they should make a Moog I banjo? I was thinking about that. Well, they do have they synth have- banjos. I mean, you had, uh, yeah. not Moog, but yeah. <laughs> that uh, was in Ithaca, New York, originally, I guess, moved down there. They moved to Asheville, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so I'm in Asheville, and a friend of mine said, uh, it was a history professor at this college near there, and said, oh, there's this uh, slave graveyard, if you'd like to go, we're, we're kind of taking, we're clearing it, you know, getting all the bushes and restoring it. I went, yeah, and found out about this grave digger who uh, was, you know, his his enslaver had him be the grave digger for people on that plantation that died, and then... Um, it just fired my imagination, and, and there no one was actually. There were no headstones before 1865, before you know the Civil War was over. There was mm. just a stone. There was just a stone. Mm-hmm. Someone's buried here, and they they did a seismic thing and checked it out. There were like 1,900 people buried under the ground there. It was like really intense and so seismic. Like they have like a measuring thing that can go like do, 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 something do, do, like that. And they yep, there's 1900 bodies down there. Yeah, they <laughs> checked it out. So I, I and I wanted that element. So I had this enslaved African become part of the story, and that went from there. And see, anyway, it goes is, on. This is a perfect example of the fact that like art happens in the action of it. Like, and the universe will like meet you halfway. Like once oh. you start. Like, because it's like, if I always think, think about, like, if I'm trying to write a poem or if I think about writing a poem, that's impossible. But you start writing a line and then another line comes and then another line. Suddenly you have a poem and it's like that you're, like, describing that, that example. Yeah, this thing was just on a silver platter here. You want to go to the slave graveyard? Right. Like, the, yeah. the universe is kind of, like, going, like, hey, bro, I'm with you. I'm picking up what you're putting down. Yeah. I'm feeling you. 
Uh, Let, let's walk together on this. <laughs> let's finish this. Let's talk about it. Yeah, that totally happened. The whole project was like that. I, I was just researching some stuff, and I was on the YouTube, as the kids say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, there was this, I found this video uh, from um, 1935 mm -hmm. uh, of the the uh, 75th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. FDR is there, and there's a video of surviving Confederate and Union soldiers on either side of the stone fence that they fought across and shaking hands. Wow. And it was like this healing thing, which is how I wanted to end the album. Dude. And so uh, that became part of it. In fact, I ended up starting with that. This is breathtaking man it's really intense because it's needed right now it's so needed it's so needed and these guys are like in their late 80s early 90s and they have their old uniforms on you know wow. these long beards and wow. it's just like you know you see them getting off a train on stretchers and wheelchairs and one guy does can still walk and does a dance a little jig and then here they are doing this and it's just unbelievable and that that became the title the title track is his favorite land i love that, that. Yeah, so. so. So, no more procrastination. Okay, I'll get it I'm out. Jeez. Like we, 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 <laughs> the nation needs you. Tony. You're all over me like a cheap suit, I, I'm Joe. I'm telling <laughs> you, bro. You need, this needs to come out, dude. Like, I know, I know. Well, we're shooting for September. Dig deep, at this Tony. Point. Dig all deep. Right, all get right. past those internal, uh, whatever, <laughs> those internal self saboteurs. <laughs> It's time for you to clock that internal self-saboteur. Bash him over the head and throw him in the closet and then sneak that album out. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'll do, do it. Do you have anything you could play from that? Ah, uh, boy. Um, yeah. Snip it. A little something. A little something. <laughs> I, 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 Even I, just play something and pretend it's on that. I could pretend it's on there, right. <laughs> Something like that. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. The crowd goes wild. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Um, so, and then, like, you know what's interesting is, like, uh, I was always a fan of Steve Martin, his comedy. Like, I was, when I was a kid, he was, like, the first comedy album I ever got. And I, so I was, like, obsessed with him and the movie The Jerk and stuff. And then he got, like, totally into the banjo to a degree that's pretty wild right and he's he's very like efficient at he's really good at yeah, it he too, was doing right? it back in the day but his recent band that you produced an album of didn't start i guess or come into fruition until 10 years ago or so or is, is that well he, he was playing the banjo in high school you know like when he was 17 oh, okay yeah because it was part of his comedy too for a while right but he the arrow in the he head. talks yeah. about you know he said i I think he talks about there's something called master class where you get these heavy duty folks talking about what they do and how you can learn also. Oh, I've seen that. And he's yeah, and, and he's he's got, he's on there. And I think I saw a little preview for it that he did. He said, you know, you don't have to have any talent at all. You just take what you got. You know, he did magic tricks at Disneyland, mm -hmm. so he did some magic and his you know and and he played some banjo. Oh, I played the banjo. I'll do that. And of course, he's incredibly talented. Right. And. Uh, um, but anyway, so he just started doing that. But he got, you know, he he was. But let me let me just interject yeah. real quick. Yeah, that is a really good example of what we're saying too about like don't let your inner saboteur stop you because that's what he prevailed in. He he just like whatever like his own perceived limitations of his skill set did not hinder him to go for it. He's like, I'm going to use a little of this, a little of that, a little of that. And maybe he wasn't a master at any of those things, but then putting the whole thing together and just the whole thing about just get it out there, do it, push, yeah. push forward. 
Oh, I'm yeah. on you like a cheap suit again, just to, on <laughs> yeah. another angle. But go. So yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Keep going. Oh no, no, that's true. But he's, he, you know, he's totally amazing because you know you hang out with him and oh, what are you up to lately? Oh, I just uh, had a book, uh, had a novel published. Right, he's novel. a good writer too. He's a really good writer. Yeah. And uh, what are you doing? Oh yeah, I just uh, curated this art show for this Canadian artist. At the Boston Museum. Steve, make room for other people, yeah, man. I Come know. on, stand <laughs> down, bro. Stand, <laughs> stand down. down. Stand down, bro. Yeah, what are you, what are you doing? Oh, I've, I've been writing songs with Edie Brickell, you know. Oh, yeah. really? Oh, yeah, we just put out an album. An album oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, and now yeah. we're doing a Broadway show. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, he's not doing movies yeah. right now because he's raising his child. He doesn't want to be gone, so. Yeah. But he's just he's like the greatest guy he's the most generous guy the most talented guy so did he need class at the lessons from you or he you joined him after he was self-taught well he he was self-taught he took some lessons from john McEwen from the nitty-gritty dirt band i don't know lessons per se but they were friends back then and john would show him some things but uh actually maybe six months ago or before this all hit i was going over to his place here in manhattan and uh I would show him some things and if he had any questions about how to do something. So we did a little bit of that. Yeah. Which is fun. Just kind of hang out for an hour and a half, just banjo out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, so you weren't, you didn't teach him. I thought you, I thought you ended up teaching him or something like I that. I didn't actually give him lessons, but I would show him things here and there. And but I, you schooled him. <laughs> no, I'm just how kidding. are his? How, how <laughs> depending are his how chops? you mean schooled? How, how are his socks? How are his chops? Is he? Oh, his is chops. He, is, cause great, I, I great socks. He, he does great collection of socks. I see, I've started wearing these. I've got sloth socks on today oh. from oh, hanging out with him because he has great socks. He inspired me. Oh. To I wear was asking about his socks. Yeah, that was that was. I got no socks. <laughs> you got nothing. <laughs> you got barefoot, nothing. Barefoot running shoes on. Sorry. How is his playing? No, he's 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 a wonderful player. Yeah, he's good. He, he, he can play Foggy Mountain Breakdown and a bunch of the standards, but he doesn't choose to do so that much because he says, you know, he, don't, he, want, he doesn't want to record that stuff because other people, how can you play better than Earl Scruggs? You know, I mean, how can you mm -hmm. beat that? So he did his own thing. He has his own style. Has composed a huge number of songs. I mean, right now on the Facebook, uh, you know, as every once in a while, it. as the kids call it, he'll put out a song he just wrote. And, and you know, so, yeah, he's really... He's a really good banjo player, and uh, he's hooking up with uh, the uh, Steve Canyon Rangers. Well, has been now for a while, and that's his band. Yeah. And so when he plays, when he does shows with Martin Short now, I mean, I, I oh did, yeah, that Netflix Netflix special of theirs that they yeah, did. Yeah, and he'll have them play on a few. I mean, he'll he'll do full blown shows shows with them. But I did one one of the Martin Short things, three sh three shows with that. But he's getting different people to do it, and it's it's really fun. And the album you produced, McCartney sang on. Did I read that correctly? Yeah. Were you, did you meet him? Yeah, it's a, kind of an interesting. You know, again, talk about you never know who you're going to run into in these, and how how did that happen? So, anyway, uh, Steve asked if I'd produce a second album of the new era mm -hmm. called Rare Bird Alert, and I said, "Sure, thanks." Yep. Yeah. And uh, he wanted, he'd written this silly love song, and uh, I, I can't remember who he wanted to get to sing it originally, but. Um, he, uh, he, uh, you know, he'd said, I, we'll, we'll do it with such and such a person. He wanted the Dixie Chicks on there as well. You know, a few heavy hitters. And, of course, he's a heavy hitter himself. But, and then my, I was talking to my son, Sean, and he said, it's a silly love song. Why don't you get Paul McCartney to sing it? And I went, yeah, right. Of course. Paul McCartney, you know. Out of the, <laughs> out of the mouths of babes. Of babes. And I went, right? well, silly love songs, you know. Manifest that shit. So Manifest, I, man. I mentioned it to Steve, and he said, uh, okay, let's I do got that. His number. <laughs> yeah, so he got in touch with Paul, and next thing you know, we're <laughs> we're flying up from Ash we were recording in Asheville, and we flew up to some small airport in uh, on Long Island, and some woman up there, the, the end, our main engineer who's from Nashville, couldn't find an, a studio anywhere near where Paul was going to be, because he somehow he could afford a place not only in London but in in uh, Long Long Island. Two places. <laughs> Two places. <laughs> He, that's wait, all he can. He can afford two whole places. I know that's shocking. That is, the second one it's, is small. It's, that's it's crazy. Small. It's that's gotta small. be small. I mean, come on. Half Pro bath. Probably an apartment, really, yeah, yeah. if you think about it. Right. It's your epiphany. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 
And uh, anyway, so he all he could find was this woman who who had a house on Long Island, who had literally a closet. Yeah. As a with as a, a laptop. A, that's all you need. <laughs> that's kind of what that's it was. You, that's all you need nowadays. It was man. like little literally a closet with a with a little window in it, and yeah. that that's that was the you know the drum room, except it was literally a closet. So anyway. We fly out there, and Paul calls to say he's going to be a little bit late, and then he shows up in shorts and flip-flops, and, you know, he was hanging out with his daughter. He had custody for that period of time, whatever. And uh, he just was making jokes and making everyone relaxed. I mean, it's, you know, where should we call him Sir Paul? Should we call him Paul? Did anyway. he smoke a joint? No, he did no. not smoke a joint. <laughs> not, the, not while I was watching. And, he probably uh, ate an edible right before. No, yeah, I'm probably, yeah. <laughs> Swallowed a chunk of, ha- chunk of hash or something. Yeah. I don't know. So anyway, he starts recording and just adding this vocal to this track. And I was the producer, technically. So here I am producing Paul McCartney. Like, really? That's incredible. That's pretty incredible. <laughs> yeah, 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 Paul, you're a little pitchy there. Exactly. Come on. Hey, P- Paul, can you do it one more time? <laughs> but uh, let's have a little bit more, you know. Dick, Dick it was Paul. 20 years ago today. <laughs> you know, a little bit more. Give it a little bit more of that, Paul. Did you slip into an English yeah, yeah, accent? Yeah, I, I didn't Hello, mean to. Paul. It just happened. Paul, I, excuse uh, me, mate. <laughs> Could you, please, we got to rewind the take. Do you know what I mean? Easy, <laughs> Paul. Oh, for fuck's sake, mate! Can... <laughs> it was going so well, and then he, he, he got really, he got really sullen, and I, I couldn't really figure what happened. And things headed south pretty quickly after that. That's wild. So he's just doing a bunch of takes, and then after about forty minutes, he comes out of his little enclosure, and I and I said, "Would you like to hydrate, and you know, to have some more water?" And uh, he said. And he's standing like you know three feet from me or two feet. You know, mm-hmm. Not there was no social distancing back then. He said, uh, uh, "Hydrate." No, no. I mean, if if I was Elvis Presley, and I was singing, "You ain't nothing but a hound dog, or rocking all the time." Oh, excuse me. Could I have a glass of water? You know, Elvis wouldn't do that. So right. here's Paul McCartney holding, you know, pretending to hold a microphone, singing "Hound Dog," a yeah. "Hound Dog," or if the Beatles were doing. She so loves saying you. he's against water. Yeah, or if the Beatles were, do, you know, if the Beatles were doing because Elvis wouldn't have water in Paul's mind. Right. That's funny, right there. Yeah, that's it's funny, like, right there. Yeah. By the way, Paul, I think Elvis probably would drink water from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing that out there, I right. don't know, like he is a superhero, but yeah, and that's then, funny, dude. That's I, really funny. And then he said, uh, or if the Beatles were singing, "She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah," and we're all like, "Holy." F. Yeah. You know. Give us here's a few Paul, more examples. Yeah, here's Paul McCartney standing <laughs> yeah. three feet away from me singing She Loves You. Yeah. Whoa. They're like, hey, Paul, let me do that again, but I'm putting on you on my Instagram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, can you do that again for the gram? Just be cool. Just be cool. <laughs> Paul, just be, just be cool. Yeah. Were yeah. you a huge Beatles fan? Me? Oh, gigantic. Gigantic. Yeah, me too. Me too. I, I uh, was in a band with Danny Harrison. Oh, really? George really? Son. How'd you do that? I know. I With know. Ben Harper, me, me, him, and Danny had a band called uh, Fistful of Mercy, and we actually just released a, a song during this quarantine again. Oh, so maybe we're still a band, but yeah. uh, uh-huh. yeah. hiatus. just on hi- a long hiatus. But so I got to record in uh, in George's studio in Friar, the, yeah, the, the, Friar Park, Friar or whatever. Park, whatever. It's and yeah. like you know, here play the guitar, this Beatles guitar, and stuff like that. It's oh. just like when you get in a situation like that, you're just like. How is this happening? I like, know. This is insane. I know. It's, yeah. it's crazy. I, I had this other experience, if I can diverge, if we can keep Please. on. Please. Yeah. Oh, no. That's, a, that's what it's Beatles for. Beatle Zone. So I went to Syracuse University in Fine Arts, which is a total waste of a college education. I was busy playing the banjo. But anyway. Shout out the University of uh, Fine Arts. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and so my advisor said, you know, you should go to our local museum, the Everson Museum in Syracuse, and, and volunteer to look good on your resume. Like, I'm going to be a, a, an art historian or work in a museum? No. But, you know, that was on the, p- the path I was on at that moment. So this is like 1970. I said, okay, I'll go to the Everson Museum. And I went, no, we, we need a slideshow about the history of the museum. Could you write the text? Okay. So I did that. It's pretty boring, but. And about two weeks later, they announced that Yoko Ono was going to come to the museum to have a one-woman one, one one show. show. And some guy named James Herodis was the director. He, and, you know, he was, it was a very stodgy museum, but he was the new director and was pretty hip, new Yoko. So she came up there to honor John Lennon's 30th birthday. So I immediately called up, hey, I just did this slideshow. Can I do this and help with the installation? They said, sure. 
So we're in there installing this plexiglass maze that she had created conceptually. And there was a VW bug with the top torn off with uh, plastic in it. And there were goldfish in there also. You know, she had like, it was a goldfish pond with, made out of a VW. And just all of her art, it was, which was pretty cool. And on like the se- second or third day, we're just in the, one of these hallways there. And in come John and Yoko. John comes dancing in, kind of spinning. It was like 1970. And I had a and and there's and then they're sort of standing off to one side with each other and I kind of and I had a question a real question to ask Yoko, so I went over to Yoko and asked her this question and John's right there, and I didn't say anything to him. I mean it was God. It's like you know yeah. Abbey Road had just come <laughs> out. What are you gonna say to John Lennon? And I didn't know at that point that he started on banjo and I could have immediately gotten into a conversation. Oh yeah. really? And my kids will never forgive me for not shaking John Lennon's hand. But anyway. And well, then, it's one of those things where, you know, it's like often in life we're too cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was too scared. Or too, or too scared. It's kind of the same thing, really. Could be construed that way, yeah. Yeah. Did the Beatles use a banjo in any of their catalog? No, but they have a song about the banjo. Actually true. It's, it's um, wow, what's it called? If you, if, if you go to the, the uh, YouTube again. And put in banjo, and it's a whole song about the banjo. Beatles and banjo. Beatles and banjo. Yeah, I can't think of what it's called. I never right knew now. John started. On. How did they not? I mean, they used the sitar and they brought all these other instruments. Yeah. How did they not? It's a good bring question. That in? I know. Uh, yeah, no, John's John's mother played. Uh, Julia played banjo. Played five string banjo, and so he started playing banjo. Please don't bring your banjo back. That's the one. That's the one. Wow. Yeah. It's like it's on one of their Christmas records, I think. It's you know, it's just a silly thing. It's actually on Sgt. Pepper. The inner groove. If you go to the inner inner groove, it's got that. No. The inner anyway. inner groove. Yeah, but anyway. Can so. you play any Beatles on the banjo? Uh, yeah. Let's see. Dude. And it goes on. That's the bluegrass. But Lucy would have been amazing. Fuck. Yeah, I d- I've done the whole thing. I tried again. you start with the banjo would you try to translate the Beatles and play for yourself and and learn those or did that come later they came later they actually came yeah somewhere in the 80s or something yeah hey when you travel with that thing do you uh, get it on a plane every time or do you ever like because I'm thinking like that thing is so nice and we already discussed it's pricey so like when you're traveling you make sure you put take that on the overhead bin it looks like it would fit but also it looks like it's on the line where you could get 
a grumpy push student. Back, yeah. You could get some pushback. Yeah. I want to hear that story and how you push back. Well, most of the time it works out. Most yeah. of the time it works out. Uh, and if they say, uh, sorry. Tony flies private. It's no problem. Yeah, <laughs> sure I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it always so, works out for this guy. Yeah. Oh, I, I throw a fit. I, I go ape shit. Do I, you? Oh, dude. I'm the worst. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> they hate the flight attendants. Hate oh, you. They yeah. hate you, but it's like, yo, it's like, you know. Yeah, no, it almost always fits in the overhead. Some of these newer planes, they're, the overheads are smaller, Tiny. and it just doesn't really quite fit. But many times they'll put it in the closet. Really? That's There's a, a closet. But will, have you ever, like, che- gate-checked it? I have gate-checked it when in a, if I have to, I'll it, gate-check isn't it. Isn't that the worst feeling? It's the worst, but at least you pick it up at the other, you know, you get yeah. off the plane. And I, I have gate-checked it before. I've, yeah, I have. when all else fails. Yeah. But I had this one experience. I was on a, you know, maybe a 50-seater, slightly smaller plane, and it looked like every seat was taken. I mean, I sat down there. I, I brought the banjo on, and I said, uh, can we... I don't think that's going to fit. I mean, there definitely wasn't room in the overhead. And uh, I didn't want to gate check it. And I said, is there a closet? No, but let me see what I can do, this, the flight attendant said. It was just this one flight attendant on the small plane. And so she said, leave it with me here. And then I see her coming back and ask somebody to move from the seat next to mine. And there was actually one other seat. And she brings my banjo back. What an angel. And lets it sit next to me on the flight, which usually would cost a, a whole airplane yeah. ticket, you know, a whole plane ticket. So, I'd like to send out a personal request <laughs> to God that that woman goes straight to heaven. <laughs> straight to heaven. I don't care what else she's done. Please, God. Saint- that and, and, woman. Saintly. Straight to heaven. What and airline? Just <laughs> I don't remember. but uh, ask Definitely God. not spirit. Earth and, to God. Please, that woman. <laughs> straight to heaven. And heaven. <laughs> ask him for or her for it to be on your next flight. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That that was like the best. That's it, amazing. That doesn't happen every day. So, do you ever tune to four thirty two? Uh, no, I don't. Have you ever heard of that? I've heard of it, and yeah. it's 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 more spiritually enriching or something, something yeah. to that effect. I I, I've, I I know about that, but I, I don't do. I it. tune all the time to four thirty two now. Really? Yeah, always lately. I'll try it. The only thing that sucks about it for a singer-songwriter type such as myself is you can't play the old harmonica then because uh-huh. the harmonicas are 440. Yep. I'm looking for some harmonica manufacturer to manufacture <laughs> ones in 432. I think that's a, I think they would. That's a billion-dollar business. I think the first harmonica company that says, you know what, 432. Get Howard Levy. You know Howard One Levy? One billion dollars will go into them. What, yeah. Who's that? He, he played harmonica with the flat tones with Bayless. Oh, band. right. And he can play chromatically on a diatonic harp. That's true. You know, so playing. he could do it. Yeah, so he could probably just I'm talking about it. Bob Dylan style, though. You know, like the one man alone with the yeah. mouth organ type I thing. Know what, I know mean. exactly what you're saying, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the Bayless Fleck thing is pretty... The Fleck tones are amazing in that way, like they, especially like future man on that guitar synth that was their drummer yeah yeah that's awesome i know yeah uh, you Bela just you know. put this thing together after yeah. newgrass revival and just had this amazing yeah he and did victor wooten talk about talk about slapping pop chops yeah just a little bit yeah just a little bit the wooten brothers the wooten brothers are, are amazing they are yeah. amazing future man and victor wooten shout out yeah totally yeah. Yeah, Bailey didn't want to have a guitar in the band. He wanted to have the banjo mid rangey kind of sound by itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then a harmonica up higher and the bass down there. Smart. Then, yeah, he just wanted space to play. And, yeah. You know, so, anyway, yeah, what a band. What a cool band. And you do lots of like writing of books and teaching and stuff like that. What do you find? Do you, do you, is that something that you're really gratified by teaching or is that something you've just done is because you've become like the best of all time in your field? <laughs> I um no I well my father was a physics professor so it must be in my gene pool somewhere and I, I just found I, I I would give reports to my family like on the history of aviation like the Wright brothers and the Fokker triplane and things like that you know I, I write this all out anyway so I guess it, many years ago I was even doing that but in 1973 a friend of mine asked me to write a book because they he'd already put out a banjo book and they wanted them to write a second one he didn't want to do that so he said why don't you have tony do it so i wrote this book called melodic banjo which is my first banjo instruction book for music sales corporation and then i wrote another five or six for them and books i've written like 15 books and now no one buys books anymore or you know it's not such a thing anymore so i've got this online banjo school 
uh, which I've had for the last 11 years now, something like that. What's that called, and how do people find that? It's the Tony Trishka School of Banjo. We came up with a really creative title. And uh, it's through you a must have tripped acid for a few days before you came up with that. <laughs> for like, a like, week, it was like a you week. guys were like tripping, <laughs> like let's get you know. Like. Yeah, it was like man, I really had to go out to get that one. <laughs> Whoops, sorry, sorry, Mr. Fifty Seven. Uh, they're built to. They're built for that. I know. They can take that all day long. I mean, I, I'm going to do the rest of this uh, under the Hudson here. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, anyways, it's with a company called Artist Works, and it's mm-hmm. really a, a pretty cool thing that they set up. Uh, they're Right now, they're over they're about 300 lessons, you know, starting from here's how you hold the banjo to bail a flick, you know, really modern stuff like that. Uh-huh. And there were over 50 interviews with everyone from Steve Martin to J.D. Crow and Earl Scruggs and on and on and Bela. And that Bikini. sounds fun. And then people can send in a video uh, if they care to. And I respond to it. It's not, uh, it, it's, it goes into a queue. It's not like in real time. But yeah. uh, anyway, so it's, you get one-on-one. Have you ever um, responded to somebody saying you're the best by with a note that says, "Hey, banjo's not there's no horse racing in music." <laughs> did you ever did it ever go full circle like that no. like where you're writing <laughs> Though it's no? uh, though it's so true that it's it's no such thing as best. But yeah, no, I don't, I don't think anyone's ever I, I don't think I've had to do that. No, full circle is great. Yeah. So through that school you could learn the banjo from scratch and how many lessons in do you f- do you figure till somebody could feel comfortable with the banjo is it like 5 lessons 10 lessons 100 lessons uh, well i mean it's a lifelong thing i mean i'd say within 10ish lessons you could be playing something you could be playing something how long that are the like lessons they're five to seven to eight minutes something oh, like that wow, the, the whole quick. concept is rather than having a whole you know 144 page book or a, a 90 minute dvd you have these bite-sized lessons so you feel a sense of accomplishment uh with each one so i'd say after maybe yeah you know, after 10 lessons you could play <laughs> so i'm sold if it's but it wouldn't lessons. it wouldn't sound, <laughs> sound like, like that, that. <laughs> It would, you, it would sound exactly like that. <laughs> Can you play the realistic version of what that would sound <laughs> like? I remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, people, people do that. People do, do that. Do I'm that. sorry. Yeah. I'm, no, I'm that's all right. You're busting my chops. Just busting. Uh, I'm busting the, you know, humans. For, yeah. Humans for chops. For people who are not savvy in music, <laughs> I'm going to give myself as an example. Like, I never really know what bluegrass actually is. Okay, bluegrass music was, it's really developed by one guy. I mean, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie invented bebop. Those are two guys. And mm-hmm. There are probably people before them sort of doing it. But as with bluegrass, but Bill Monroe, father of bluegrass music from Rosine, Kentucky, really invented it. And it, in its final form in 1945, Earl Scruggs joined Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys on the Grand Ole Opry. And that became bluegrass as we know it today. Uh, a guy named Lester Flat was in the band. If you've heard of Flat and Scruggs, and you've heard all that stuff, and whatever, Flat and Scruggs was a big band in the folk era and bluegrass and beyond. But anyway, they were in the band, and that that became the thing. You know, Bill Monroe played mandolin, had this high piercing tenor, uh, stand up bass, uh, guitar, uh, banjo, and you know, and that that became the template. For the for bluegrass. So what defines bluegrass? The sonic texture, or like the tempo of the thing, or what? What? It's it's the it's the sonic texture, and it's it's a very roll. You know, every instrument has its role. Like the mandolin will be hitting off beats, and chat, and chat, and chat. That's its lock into the into the puzzle. Mm-hmm. And guitar is going boom, ching, boom, ching, boom, ching, boom, ching, like that. And bass is dom, bom, bom, bom. The root mm-hmm. note and the five note. And the band just sort of dances above that, and the fiddle, I didn't even mention fiddle before, but fiddle's doing fills and leads. Mm-hmm. And it's a very improvisatory kind of music in the standard, in a standard instrumental tune, shall we say, if it's a banjo tune, because I t- tend to think in terms of the banjo. It'll start with a banjo break, one time through the form. Like, should I play Foggy Mountain Breakdown? Fuck May yeah. I? Please. Okay, if you insist. We love it when you play. <laughs> Thank you. 
Anyway, Foggy Mountain Breakdown. So you played one That's time so through nice, that. Dude. Oh, thank you. And then the fiddle comes in, takes a break, and then back to the banjo, and then the mandolin might take a break. Of course, not on Foggy Mountain Breakdown, but if we're an instrumental like that. Were they doing it on one mic at the time? Originally, was that they, from back then? They were doing it for on, off of one mic, which people are doing. I play with a guy named, a guy named Michael Daves, this incredible singer and guitar local. player from Brooklyn. Local. Yeah, yeah he's amazing. <laughs> And uh, he always likes to work with one mic, so when we play together, we just use one mic. Mm. In the studio, I think they might have two mics in the old days, you know, like in the, in the 40s. Jerry Douglas has that tribute band, the Earls of... Uh, Lester. L- Lester. Right. To Scruggs and the other dude you mentioned. Lester Flat. Yeah, yeah. they're doing... Th- so that's bluegrass proper. That's bluegrass proper. They're going back and playing a lot of the old tunes in the old way, trying to keep it you know the way it used to be so and there are, there are a lot of traditionalists out there that like to keep it the way it was in 1945 which is the greatest bluegrass of all time but you know other people like to stretch in the boundaries in modern day did bluegrass survive to today you feel oh yeah totally it's yeah they have all these bluegrass festivals out there that's well you know those, those won't be happening again anytime soon but yeah uh the first one was in 1965 which i had the great fortune of going to it was in Fincastle, virginia and they had bill monroe reno smiley the stanley brothers all the mac wiseman jimmy martin all the big names in bluegrass they were all there it was the first three-day festival started by a guy named carlton haney and then they just proliferated after that so and there are many many during the summer and, and overseas too and in many foreign countries as well so so no bluegrass is very healthy and there's something called the ibma which is the international bluegrass music association and they keep pushing bluegrass forward and you know helping people that in times of need like this did you ever do any like jam band stuff like grateful dead type of stuff or like you know like playing with a band of that nature uh yeah i've done a little bit of that i i actually had this electric band like i was saying in the uh kind of late 90s early aughts and we were on the jam band circuit quite a bit right but we were a little too jazzy i think to get over the the way they would want to be heard but uh but uh, yeah I've, I've done some jam band sort of things yeah uh i would think you'd be good at that yeah no it's really fun uh uh fr- a friend of mine was playing with one of those bands and a uh, great mandolin player and uh he said man i got a solo for three minutes yeah in bluegrass you got your 45 <laughs> second slot man you gotta just go for 45 you know for three minutes or four minutes and, on uh, one jam and it's like but it's kind of nice to open it up like that yeah so uh yeah and i've gone to see fish my son is a big fish head and so actually john fishman's father was my orthodontist so <laughs> the drummer and fish so. oh okay i didn't yeah. know who that was. i don't really i'm not familiar with them that much Me i mean I, I, yeah. I know they're huge yeah they're in that circuit yeah they're they're the what about social media do you have a present do you post things there yeah i i have someone who does that for me i have a slight aversion to social media it's all i can do to i'm, I'm busy enough just doing you know emails and yeah things like that but i had i do have someone but as in terms of just like uh, you know getting your music this album out like a, a good a good sort of ploy i think is like recording you know little versions of the songs or whatever and like and and piecemealing it out there letting people hear because i'm I'm sure like if you posted like examples of your playing or songs too now like particularly i think one of the things that has happened from this pandemic is one people really need music now and really appreciate music like they haven't in quite a while and especially stuff like what you're doing or like the you know the the themes you're working with on, on your album and also just your whole presence like um and then also it's a way for you to um trick the saboteur because <laughs> you like you're releasing it and then all of a sudden it's like well it's nothing too precious already i've already started putting things out and that's kind of like the way pop culture is is moving i feel like more and more like people don't have to feel so precious and concerned about each little thing because you can kind of release things as a matter of course right you know yeah i mean having an album out as an album is a little it's less meaningful dated. It's, all, it's dated it's, i mean but the thing is this this song tells a story that you sort of need to hear from beginning to end well, most right. uh, albums it doesn't matter with this it, it but is you do both you do you do it all you know you have you have people because you know the the amount of people that are going to really take in a whole 50 minute 
thing, uh, you know, are few. Yeah, to be I get honest, that. like that's the way the world is. That, you know, people like listen to tracks. You know, yeah. For me, it's the same thing. You know, I yeah. have Apple Music, and I, I don't listen to a whole album from beginning. I don't. Yeah. I don't sit down and do that. I don't have the time and, and or the inclination. I want to hear this, and I want to hear this. So. Right. Yeah. And that whole thing. But so. um, but I, I have this thing called Quarantoni that I'm doing every Thursday night. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. What, what's that? So what's <laughs> it, that? It's, it's a, a streaming thing on Facebook on my oh, Facebook page. So you're already page. doing it. I, I'm doing that. Yeah. Which. Uh, I do some, mostly it's been live. I've done a couple of shows with my son, who's a great drummer and wonderful guitar player, and uh-huh. he sings, and we've done two of the shows. We've done, I think, six or seven now, and I've a couple of, two or three solo things, and then I did um, something, I've uh, rebroadcast, if you will, uh, a couple of things from Joe's Pub that I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, one with uh, the Better Halves, which is these people like Jill Sobule and Tracy oh, Bonham. I know Jill. Yeah, and Tracy. And, and Tracy. Tracy. Yeah, Tracy's been on the podcast. I, I've been in chill for a while. Yeah, yeah. So, and some of these amazing women uh, uh, that are just, you know, uh, Sid Straw. Yeah. Uh, people I've worked with in the past and just put them all together. So, um, but anyway, so some rebroadcasts of things, then more live stuff too. So, that's cool. Yeah. So, yeah. every Thursday I've been doing that at 8 p.m. For anyone out there paying attention, 8 p.m. Yeah, and what's your Facebook page? Just Tony Trishka. Tony Trishka, yeah. Just go yeah. to that. Yeah, the Tony Trishka. The Tony Trishka. <laughs> I haven't met other Tony Trishkas, that's for sure. Hey, can I ch- try out this other banjo yeah, for you yeah, guys? Yeah, yeah, please, please. Uh, wow, can you can wow. you hand that to me since yeah, I'm sort of on. locked in place here? This is my current. I mean, I love my Deering banjo. That's my main squeeze. But this is. I just got this. This is something that Bale of Fleck developed called the Missing Link. And it's tuned down low. It's tuned down to an open C chord. Wow. The, ban- the other banjo is open G. Wow. This is much lower. And just has it. I've just been. I've written like four or five tunes on it while we've been quarantining away here. Yeah. Uh, can I play you something on this? Would love that. Let's see. Um. So it's it's really fun to play on this thing. Just, just that was ma- beautiful, man. Thank you. It just makes you think in all different ways, you know, than I would on that other banjo. So how so? I don't know. It's just it's thicker strings and just a whole different sound. And uh, mm-hmm. it's just you know, I've just been really inspired to write all these tunes. So 
Does it have a different emotional quality, the songs you wrote on that, than to the other ones? Or Yeah. Um, I mean, I wrote one that's more of a bluegrassy kind of thing, but... Uh. than some yeah. of the other things but yeah it, it, yeah I, I, it makes me think a little bit differently than I would on that instrument I mean yeah. you, can, you can write pretty things there too of course but it's it's just different it lends itself to pretty things this one I think so yeah yeah I guess the lower the lower tones the lower register kind of opens things up and I like the look of it too the black look of it yeah yeah it's, it's really cool yeah this is again Bela's Bela's baby he, he designed that, this that also looks expensive uh, it's cheaper than this, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Surprisingly affordable. Do you talk, did you, when Bela was um, making that, did you talk to him or anything? Or did he like say, hey, I'm going to make a lower one? What uh, do you think? I or? think we talked about it a little bit, but it, I mean, it was he was totally in charge of all the development of it. You know, he didn't yeah. consult with me or anything. He just sort of did it. He didn't ask permission? Gee, I... <laughs> <laughs> Hey God. man, can I make a lower one? <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I I I would have had to think about that a little bit if I were would give permission or not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he acknowledges you a lot. He right? does. He he's, honored. He's, I mean, he played at your 70th birthday at Joe's Pub. Weren't you on stage with him at the Garden too? Yeah, yeah. We that was really an amazing time. Yeah, it was for Pete Seeger's 90th birthday, and we did a we did a couple of Pete Seeger things, kind of as a medley. And no one had played Happy Birthday yet, and so Bela said, "Hey, let's yeah, let's do a Happy Birthday in here," and the whole place just went crazy. Mm. So yeah, that that was a real special night. Again, I'm just such a huge Pete fan. Should I play a little Pete thing? I don't want to. Yeah. Go over time here. Did you meet Pete? Oh yeah, I was friendly with him. Uh, Did you clam up next to him like Lennon or not? No, no. Pete was just Pete, but he was Pete. You know, he was like Pete's here. Yeah. Um, Uh, no, no, I, I, my wife had a, my wife Asunta had a wonderful concert series in Farallon. Uh, she wanted to give back to our community and she brought in Loudon Wainwright and the Del McCurry and just a whole sorts of great folks and Pete. And I called up Pete and said, would you come down and do a, do a show for this concert series? And he said, sure, as long as you have people of, you know, people of color there. He wanted to not just have a white audience, you know, and so... Uh, my wife worked in Teaneck. She was a teacher there, and so had some of her friends come out and uh, have the audience less all white. And uh, and Pete was great. He did the show, and the bathroom, the backstage bathroom, broke that morning. So he just wandered out into the audience and went to the bathroom when he had to go to the bathroom, you know, before the show. Um, But um, I thought you were saying he just wandered out into the audience and went to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> he took a piss on a tree <laughs> right in the corner. No, no, Come no, on, no, Pete. No, there was a bathroom back there also. So no, he went there. I get it. No, but I, um, no, no. Uh, but I, um, he wrote a song called. Uh, I'll play it for you, and then the title will come to my mind. It's called Quite Early Morning. I love that. It's this beautiful song, and I, uh, we were both on the same show at this concert place in, in New Jersey, and uh, he played that. I'd never heard it before yeah. in his set, and I said, hey, Pete, backstage, could you show me that? Yeah. And I, I recorded him playing it anyway yeah. and learned it, so that's close to note for note the way he played it. But um, I had a chance to uh, 
me and this guy that put on this show that I'm talking about were invited up to Pete's place in Beacon. Uh, and we got up there. This was when he was 94, right at the end, basically. And we get there and knock on the door, and his daughter, Tina, answers the door and said, we're here to see Pete. And she said, I know. Uh, well, he's sleeping right now. Uh, and we said, well, we'll just go into town and get some coffee or something. And she said, no, no, I'll wake him up. It's okay. So we go into the living room, and, and uh, after about five or ten minutes, Pete comes out with two canes on, and he's pretty pretty frail at this point and he sits down and uh, we talk for a little while then he says uh, Tony can you hand me my banjo and I went to hand him the long neck banjo which was on the wall but uh, he said no 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 my shoulder hurts uh, give me the shorter neck banjo so I got the shorter neck banjo and handed it to him and he played the song that I just played for you mm -hmm. and he said this is my favorite song that I ever wrote Wow. And it's always darkest before the dawn, and uh, this music just keeps moving on. Something to that effect. It's a really positive song. Mm. <clears throat> and then um, and then when these fingers can play no longer, give the, give the old banjo to those, those young ones stronger. Something to that effect. Wow. It's like this really intense song. And, you know, he, he was frail, but he could play it, and he sang it in this very, you know, not the strongest Pete voice, but he sang it. And then um, he said, you know, uh, what I've been doing lately is trying to remember Shakespeare's 65th sonnet. And I wrote it out on two sheets of shirt, shirt cardboard that I taped together. And if you could follow along and make sure I'm singing it correctly. And so he hands me the shirt cardboard and I start reading along. And he reads it. He said, does, recites it from memory at the age of 94 perfectly, the whole thing, which is about how music can save the world is what he said. But I read, mm. read it later on and it was more about mortality and death this sort of thing that's interesting and then he said you see that that uh, wood stove over there i designed that i said really pete and he said why don't you put some wood in there and I, uh, he said grab that log over there and put it in there that's what he would do for exercises split wood mm -hmm. uh just this beautiful house overlooking the hudson river you know anyway so I put oh. some wood in there and he said okay now put that over there and he said well I, i'll tell you what i'll just do it myself and so he kind of walked over there and i put a chair down and he sat down and starts putting the wood in and he leans forward and the whole chair he starts to go into the fire. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, and so we talk a little bit more, and then you know it was he was getting tired. We could tell, and then we figured that we we should leave. And he went into the hospital the next day for the last time. And I talked to his grandson, and he said that song that he sang for us was probably the last song he ever sang. That's amazing, man. It's just really amazing. And uh, they put the banjo on his on his chest uh, one more time when he was in the hospital and had him strum across at one time but that was the last time he played the banjo but wow anyway so anyway what a story man yeah so yeah <laughs> dude Pete, yeah that was pretty intense that's intense as it comes wait now what was the thing by shakespeare which one was it the 65th sonnet the 65th sonnet i'm gonna look that up yeah check that out thank yeah. you thank you for that story too yeah it was amazing that's incredible I mean, that song is beautiful too, and, and the power of it is in its uh, in the soul of it. it is is the soul of it. It's not really technically like as like nuts or anything. It's yeah, it's it, relatively simple, isn't it? It's very it's a simple song, but just a beautiful message. It's always darkest before the dawn. You know, let's sing songs and just what we need today. You know. Yeah, exactly. What we so need today. Yeah. What, what we what we desperately need today. I could play you one more Pete thing here if, uh, if you're game. Absolutely. Because people think of Pete as always strumming, and that was, you know, really basically what he did. But he was really a, an amazing banjo player, which I didn't realize till some years later. He has an album called The Goofing Off Suite, and this comes from that, which he recorded in 1955. Let's see. And this is on there, it's called, um, it's Blue Skies by Irving Berlin, adapted to the banjo.
And I should mention, because I didn't, that's all Pete Seegers. That's note for note what he played in 1955. That's incredible. Yeah. And then I asked him if he still played any tunes. This was maybe two years before he passed. We did the show together. And he said, well, I only play 10 banjo songs anymore, which I don't know if I believe that, but that's what he said. And I said, do you still play Blue Skies? And he said, yeah. And he was like 92 at the time when he played that. And he could play that. He could still play that, yeah. It's incredible. Did you play with Bruce Springsteen as well? Uh, sort of. Um, yeah. When he was doing his Seeger Sessions project, oh, yeah. he had, they needed a banjo player, and they called up some music store in New Jersey and found some banjo player, who was a good banjo player, uh, who re- did a, the recordings on the album, which they did piecemeal over time. And then when it was time to go on tour for a year through America and Europe, they were auditioning people because they asked this guy, same guy, do you want to go on tour? No, I've got this sound company, and I don't want to give that up. So, But it's a year-long tour with Bruce Springsteen, but he didn't want to do it. And, of course, you have to respect that. So they auditioned people, so I got to go to Asbury Park along with four or five other people and uh, audition, and they were rehearsing the band to do, to do that. It's like this, you know, 13-piece band or something. I saw some of those shows. Yeah, great shows. And, uh, and so... I, I was up in the um, some upper dressing room of the I can't remember the Paramount Theater I guess in Asbury Park, and they had like you know someone at the soundboard and they had the monitors. I mean it was all set up you know rehearsal stage the whole thing. And uh, anyway, so as I was coming down the stairs, Bruce was going up and I got to meet him, just shake his hand, and then before uh, as I was about to walk on stage, uh, Patty Scaffold is there, scoping people out, just engaged me in conversation. So you know to make sure I wasn't a psycho or something, you know. And uh, anyway, we used to hang out. My, our family used to go down to the Jersey Shore during the summer, so we got to talk about that. So anyway, um, but then I got to play for 45 minutes while he ran ran tunes for the band. And, you know, I mean, he was like four feet away or something like that because the banjo, for, for some reason, he wanted the banjo close to him. And he would say, come over to me and say, yeah, do you know Froggy went to court? And I said, yeah, my parents used to sing that to me, whatever. So I, I got to play with the boss for 45 minutes. I didn't get the gig. You didn't get the gig. Why uh, not? Cause how, I, how could you not get the gig? I was too tall. I was too old. And, you know, it just wasn't cool enough, I guess. Something. You're too tall. Yeah, maybe. It <laughs> could have been. The guy that got the gig was shorter, so. That's all it was, yeah. man. Who was it? It, like, you, Bruce, Bruce didn't, <laughs> Us tall guys have to stick together. I man. know. I'm, I'm with you <laughs> on I'm that, like, Joe. Dude, come I'm, on. Uh, come on. It's discrimination. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. What, what, what should we call that? Yeah. Um, well, the guy named Greg List was the guy that got the gig. He's a great guy, and he's a friend of mine. So, okay. All right. But yeah. uh, but at least I got to do that for 45 minutes, and it wasn't only songs. Uh, you know, he did some of his regular repertoire too, so it was kind of cool to play yeah. banjo with Bruce. So it was it was a nice. Well, moment. I'll tell you what, man. If that ever happens, and I'm doing auditions, you're going to get that gig. Thank you. As one <laughs> tall person to another, I, this tall guy that. can I can I can deal with you. <laughs> I can deal with it. That's because you're tall. Yeah. Right. Six foot five. Oh really? Yeah, I've only seen you sitting down. I'm so. circus tall. You're circus tall. I'm six. <laughs> no, I'm no, six no, one. No, 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 no. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, man, dude. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this, yeah. Tony. Thank you. This is a blast. True. This yeah. is really true fun. Honor, thank you all of you. Pleasure, honor for Tony. us. Oh man, a pleasure. This Total was a pleasure. blast, man. We went for like an hour and forty minutes so far. Didn't hour we? and a half. Yeah. Yeah. I've more. overstayed my welcome, obviously. No, so. no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. You said allow two hours, so I guess we're under that. That. Yeah. Do we have? Any, do you have any other questions for Tony before? Um, the other thing I was going to ask you before, and I guess this would be my last question. You did get to meet your hero, Earl. Oh yeah. And I'm assuming you didn't clam up like Lennon for that either. And how is that meeting like? Because he is the number one. Yeah, he's, and, he and always will be. Recorded with you and le- became your friend, I assume. So how? Yeah. Uh, d- I think I met him in the... Good question, s- dude. Good question, yeah. Nice. So, somewhere in the 70s, I met him at a festival or something. Just a, a quick, you know, back and forth. Um, and then uh, it, it just got, I got to be friendly. He would play at B.B. At, um, King's on 42nd Street, and I would go back down. Back then? It was still B.B. King's? No, not back then. So No, no, in, in the 2000s, in, oh, the, in okay, the aughts. okay, okay. Or whatever, ten, fifteen years ago, he t- he played there a couple of times, and his his son Gary was in the band. And when he would go to get paid, 
and all the other folks had gone, all the other rest of the band had gone back to the Earl hotel. Earl would stick up the place. He would, he would just hang yeah. out there until Gary was, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he was a confidence man. <laughs> yeah. I like my version of the story. I, 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 <laughs> I'm glad you I'm glad Interview you Joe, let yeah. you answer for oh, me. I'm I, I don't sorry. have I'm this terrible. story. Go, go, go. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Rob them blind. <laughs> Rob right. them blind. With those guns, those bandages are loaded, dude. Yeah, I know. Yeah. There actually is some <laughs> movie, some western somewhere yeah. where that actually happens this guy he's got a banjo he comes out with a banjo into the street to duel with this guy and it turns out it's like a it's winchester or something loaded, yeah i mean there's actually a, an actual movie that has that in it yeah yeah it shoots with a banjo so but anyway not that far well, you're not you're not far off at all actually so somebody look, got there before me. nothing nothing back here right? it's all okay um anyway and so i would uh, gary said why don't you go back and hang out with dad i went oh, okay sure so i would just hang wow. out there for like 25 minutes half an hour and just talk to him about various things and at, at this one point one of these two times when I was back there in the dressing room some woman came back who was a, a, a server there and she was drunk and she oh, I can't find where they don't have my paycheck and she's kind of complaining and then asks Earl who are you uh, I'm Earl Scruggs uh, you know and and she was getting a little it was like she was overstaying her welcome and I was about to kind of stand up and say so maybe I'll go out with you and we'll, we'll find your check something right and instead he said very nice to meet you. That's all he said. It was sort of like this Yoda thing. Uh -huh. And then she went, nice to meet you. And she walked out. It was like, right. he just had that, he had that thing. He knew how to do it. Yeah. He was like a Zen master. He was a Zen master. I didn't even know it till that moment. Like, whoa, Earl, well, look what you just did. And did you get to play He diffused, like it was a potentially awkward as hell situation, getting weird and aggressive, and he diffused it. He totally diffused the whole situation. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. And then did she you play on in. stage with him? No, I oh, didn't play on stage with him. What did you guys talk about back there? I don't remember exactly. He was not the most talkative person, but he would tell stories about the old days. One story he told about was uh, they had done the Beverly Hillbillies, Flatten Scruggs did the Beverly Hillbillies. Oh, right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, play that, dude. <laughs> well, Jethro... <laughs> Allie Mae, <laughs> Jed. <laughs> nice. Anyway, uh, there it is. It's, it's de rigueur. You have to play that. Yeah. But he would say that, so they'd done that and been on the show a number of times. And then they started, the, uh, Paul Henning, I think, who was the producer of that, was doing Petticoat Junction. <laughs> Petticoat Junction. Anyway, I'm doing the theme songs from all these songs. Mm -hmm. These shows. Petticoat Junction, not one of the great cultural high points of American culture. But anyway, uh, they, they wanted Earl to be the, the uh, engineer, the train engineer on Petticoat Junction. Mm. And Earl said, well, you know, it would break up Flat and Scruggs. And they, they said, well, well, we'll fly you to the Opry every, you know, from L.A., well, from Hollywood, we'll fly you to the Opry every Saturday night so you can do the Grand Ole Opry. Anyway, he passed on it. So banjo history would have been much different with Earl Scruggs as the engineer. And then there's mm. another story he told about how he did this. They did a, a film on him called Earl Scruggs, I think Family and Friends or Earl Scruggs and Friends. And he had the birds on there with Clarence White on guitar. And Dylan was doing They did Nashville Skyline together and East Virginia Blues. And I think Joan Baez is there. But anyway, they wanted to get Ravi Shankar on there mm. in the movie. And Ravi was in, in Nashville but they couldn't get the film crew together, but Ravi came over anyway with Al Rakai, his, his tabla player. And they hung out for a while, and then Earl said, after we played for a little while, boy, would I like, like to have heard that. But anyway, after a little while, they were getting hungry, and so the, and Earl uh, asked Ravi, so what would you like to have? And he wanted Kentucky Fried Chicken. So they just sat on the floor and ate <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken with Ravi That's Shankar. That's what Ravi Shankar wanted? He wanted Kentucky <laughs> Fried Kentucky Chicken. Kentucky Fried? Yeah. <laughs> KFC. 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 Is, <laughs> Another you just can't make that kind of shit up. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> really? you, you know, when you want KFC, you want KFC, yeah, I yeah. guess. No tabbouleh? I mean, what? what? I, okay. I thought he would right be a vegetarian. Yeah, tandoori, tandoori chicken? No, no. You sure it wasn't vegetarian <laughs> chicken? <laughs> KFC soy it's chicken. signature bucket. <laughs> <laughs> the rubber shank, our signature bucket. Well, that's a great idea. With the side of slaw. 
<laughs> and some and some mashed potatoes. Yeah, yeah. Did, did he was he familiar with uh, your prowess on the instrument? Uh, I, you know, it's funny because I called him one time. We would always call him on his birthday, and uh, I called him this one time and said, "I hear you have a new show." And I'm thinking, maybe he's confusing me with someone else. So I said, I have a new band. So he must have known that, but he called it a show. Because in Flatten Scruggs, it would be a show. Mm-hmm. They would have, uh, you know, they would, you know, Lester Flat would do a little flat foot while they played Beverly Hillbillies. And, you know, it was a show. It was mm-hmm. more entertaining than just getting up playing songs. But uh, so I, I think he had some idea. Uh, and when I asked him to be on the album, he agreed. So I guess that was something. He must yeah. have had some awareness of it. And that, that's one of the high points of my life, you know. We recorded it. Bela Fleck has a, has a studio in his basement. We did it there, so. And we played Farewell Blues. I could play that. Yeah. That'd be a way to go out. Let's go out on that then. Yeah. Hey, Tony, thank you for thank doing you, this, Tony. man. Thank you, both of you. It's, it's really been a pleasure. It's great. Great to be doing something, yeah. not just online, in person. And even though we're... Uh, we are socially distanced. Uh, fairly socially distanced. Out there. Yes. Fairly socially distanced. You're yeah. about thirty feet away, and you're about. No, we're, I'm we're, at least six. You're at least six. We're definitely within the six feet range. Yeah. yeah. No virus can jump between <laughs> that us that far, <laughs> and the banjo repels viruses. It's yeah. un, unknown to most people. Okay, so this is a song that's called. This is farewell blues. It's an old jazz standard that uh, Earl picked up and changed around and made great. Farewell Blues. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Joe, and everybody. Dude, thank you so much. Thank you, man. Thank you. I just have to say, that's the coolest thing. Yeah. The tune's in C, and he's playing in C sharp. Yeah. Like in 1950. Anyway. Yeah, that is dope. For yeah. the final, the final geek out. It's a very, uh, yeah. It's got a, it's like a blue note or something. It's a, bend, yeah. It's a bendy thing. <laughs> yeah, it's it a hits bendy the, thing. It hits that emotion in that right, just right. It's like that, that emotional space of badassness. Way you badassness. Know, we're way badassness. That's that way <laughs> badassness note. Not small badassness. No, nah, way man, badassness. Way, way bad. You're way badassness, dude. <laughs> that's that's what I think. <laughs> Thank right, you guys yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank God you. God bless the everybody. Appreciate Bye-bye. you. Bye. Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast, and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated.